Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Layton. I'll be chairing this session. So um, I really like that role. It means I get to be the centre of attention for a little while, but I don't actually have to do any work. Um, so um, we've got a pretty strict schedule. So with the idea of keep, you know, keeping things in tune with the other talks so people can move around. Um, but um, so it means after the talk, we'll have a 10 minute break. So if you want to go to one of the other mini comps, then uh, feel free to do that. And there'll probably be people coming in as well. Um, uh, as we sort of spoke about before the break, um, it's probably a bit late now, but next time you move, uh, try to take the seats up the front because people do move around and stuff like that. Um, plenty of spare space up here. Um, all right, so without further ado, uh, first up we got Tennessee. Um, so Tennessee, um, talking before, he started programming before the internet was around, or the web, um, which means he's had to learn how to program without Stack Overflow, uh, which <laughs> bit painful. So um, I'll hand over to him and uh, welcome in Tennessee. Okay, thanks very much Robert. Um, yeah, so this talk isn't amazingly deep or, or insightful or a, a huge training session. It's more about this particular idea of a data hackathon and there's no real time to be deep or insightful in, in a data hackathon. Um, hands up who's done one of these before. Okay, so how many of you finished something on time? Right, that's a lot less hands. Okay, so, so that tells me this talk is not wasted. So this talk is about that problem. Um, that essentially what you might have in a typical data hackathon is like, like two days or like maybe a week, you know, d depending on exactly what the format is. So you're down on a time scale where if you lose an hour to something you didn't need to lose it to, that, that's significant. If you lose six hours uh, to something you didn't need to lose it to, that, that's also... Uh, at the very least, highly disappointing. Um, so I, I went in one, one recently and took a, a few sort of notes from that experience about what worked and what didn't work. So anyone who's considering participating in, in something of this structure might have, have some notes for what to go on about. So for everyone else, what do you do in a data hackathon? So if you if you've been, you've probably seen plenty online, so I don't need to over explain this, but you generally need to predict something, uh, visualize or explain something, pitch an idea, make a demo, or make a video of a demo that you pretend works. Um, that's, that's, roughly the, that's roughly the spread. And it, different people are diff interested in different parts of it. So one of the things about a data hackathon is that a lot of the time it's not just technical people, like GovHack ran last week, and that's sort of similar. And you know maybe one person in four or five was really a strong developer, and everyone else was brought something else and something quite different to the table, and that was based around the idea of making a video or a website or application that demonstrated sort of an interesting concept. And, and I know coming from the developer side that that extra ability to like give a reason to what you're doing is actually very valuable because I'm terrible at that. I just know how to make stuff work. So what things are in this, in this talk? There, there's managing time. In a datathon, you basically have no time. So it becomes quite important to Knock, it, knock down as many things at the start that, that are going to cause you to stumble. Uh, divide things up well in a team. Step three, we'll return to this later if there's time. Uh, so basically, set up your environment and then a, a little run through on how to do uh, a few, few basic things you might need to do. Uh, anyone who's been to my talks before knows I'm not very much in favour of the just stand here and talk for, for, for half an hour. So I encourage people to interrupt or have a conversation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, half the people in the room will know more than I do about any particular slide that I'm talking about. So we might as well treat each other as, as a room full of peers as, as anything else. So just sing out. And if I get stuck, I'll uh, turn to you for the answer. OK. So what kind of data is in a datathon? There's usually CSV files containing some kind of record set. Um, it may be something that's sort of got dumped out of a database somewhere, but traditionally they won't go, here's a Postgres database file, they'll go, they'll, they'll extract it out into something that's a little, little more of a, a simpler data format, could be time series data, might have image, images in directories, usually where you know something about those images, uh, array based image like data, where the actual sort of pixel values have some kind of semantic meaning like a measurement or something like that. But basically you can just largely treat them as images for the purposes of working with the data. Uh, a bunch of documents with or without metadata. 
um, or something that's a mix of these things where there's some kind of record format where like there's an image and as well as that there's some information about the image like the time and the location and, and things along those lines. So a lot of, a lot of the Datathon stuff's w about working with the data. Um, so I was at GovHack again last week and I reckon like a good half of the time was just spent working with the data. So al almost all of these include, like the machine learning, like it just works. You know, you actually don't need to reinvent machine learning in your hackathon. What you need to do is get your data into the right format so that you can just feed it to the tools in a straightforward fashion in the data hackathon. Um, and then learn how to quickly throw those things on a website uh, in some kind of way you can visualize it. So one of the things that's not that's quite useful is having worked with similar data before. Um, so if you know that your, your data hackathon is patient data or something, you go, aha, that's a kind of time series type deal, or it might be, uh, well, it depends what it is. Like if it's prescription data or transactions, it might be time series. If it's where people are sick, it might be geospatial, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just like a basic set of where you can get like well-structured data sets for trying something out in advance. Now, it's not necessary for you to have worked through all of these problems or even the, the one in hand before the, the data hackathon, but it will mean that you've got a predefined way of going about the work um, in advance. So if you can do that, it's probably pretty helpful. Um, environment setup, super hard. No, it's not really. You just clo clone this thing and, and it'll work. Now, environment setup is super hard if you're all on different laptops and you haven't talked about it beforehand with different operating systems and different versions of libraries then it really, really is super hard because all of a sudden you'll find you cannot transfer or share work between people and you will suddenly lose six hours to trying to track down why this version of that thing doesn't work on Windows or on Linux or wherever it may be. So going through, it, it's like conceptually trivial, but you absolutely can lose half of your time to just trying to make the thing work or you'll just lose a disappointed teammate because two thirds of the team has a functioning environment and one third of them just one third of you just gets bored and goes away. So um, this is a very simple repository. There are no examples or anything. It is just shell scripts to set up an Anaconda Python environment with the latest version of the most relevant libraries for this kind of activity. And then there's a bunch of add-on scripts. And I had I'd tried to do this a few times, like at work and for datathons, this, that, and the other, and I'm like, well, I need something that'll like spin up an environment and show you how to structure your directories and make you know data and input data and all of these sort of complicated things. And it just, even that was too complicated for working with other people. Like they had different ideas. I'd find them, you know, you know, six hours into like building their own environment out of shell scripts. And it like, it was just too complicated. So there's nothing in here other than just installing the common set of base packages so that everyone's got the basic tools to work with. And from there on in, you're basically in shell scripts, bash, and Jupyter notebooks. So step one of, of the data th thon is data ingestion. It's, I, I hate it. It's boring. It's unavoidable. So yeah, your chief strategy is to find someone who does not know this fact and, that, uh, uh, <laughs> and, and make them do it. If you have to do it, I'm very, you know, then, then this is for you. So here we go. So, so the fall asleep part of the data thon is so databases, step one, just use each SQLite. Don't use Postgres, don't use whatever other things you've got. Don't just use CSV files, don't use Google Big Table, just use SQLite. Now the reason I say that is one is, is it's like, it comes with Python, so you don't have to do anything about it. The files are transportable on USB key or via Wi-Fi, so there, is no, there, there are no user permissions, there's no complicated anything, you just go bang here, here's your data, shove the USB key in. And for the purposes of data processing, it is as fast as the other technology choices um, that are available. I mean, there's, you know, there's no security and there's no transaction locking, that, well, that maybe there is, I don't know, but I don't think there's transaction locking and there's definitely not scaling out. But for when your environment is the laptops you've got around, it's perfect. If you're using some kind of cloud thing, so a lot of people go, oh, no, Tennessee, you shouldn't set people up on their laptops. You should get them all onto the cloud. Well, that's, that's great until the Wi-Fi drops out. And, and then it becomes like very challenging. And also, it's more difficult than you'd expect and more expensive than you'd expect to get like four people all working on the same environment. You either have to go through some like recipe of SSH key sharing and dealing with the fact that only some of you know how to actually do SSH key sharing. Like, 
it's just, I actually don't find it practically worth it in the time available. And you certainly makes it harder to like go out from the venue to a coffee shop or go back home and keep working. The upsides are that the, the cloud instances can persist. So if you've got a long running job on one, then yeah, great. You can like turn your computer off and the, the, the magic cloud machine will keep going. But like it's more, it's, more, it's, a, it's more sophisticated. If you can take that on, good for you. But by and large, it's not, it, it's still worth having everyone on a common base starting point, I find. Um, don't use other in, in relational databases. I think they'll just slow you down unless you know those things back to front. Um, don't, if you need to cache bits of table-like data, so most of the machine learning tools want basically, you know, column, like, like squares of data, you know, in one shape or form, and they will process it row-wise. And so you will often go, oh, I need to add a column, I need to remove a column, et cetera, et cetera. And then you might go, I need to save that out to share with someone else and go, hey, I've pre-processed the data and joined the tables just how I want it. And now I've got this big blurg of data that I want to feed to my model. I'll save it out to CSV. It is much faster to use um, something called Apache uh, Feather format. And it's basically, it's effectively like a binary thing that just plugs into pandas that you can read and write from. We tried CSV, HDF5, NetCDF, um, and this, this feather format thing, and the feather format thing was faster by like a factor of like two. Um, we also tried Dask, so some people go, oh great, I can do, th this, sounds th this sounds unrelated, but we did it at the same time, so it's related to me. Um, we tried Dask, which was a, is like a distributed thing, which will like use multiple nodes and so forth. What I found is that that was actually also slower on a single machine than just going through the process. So, and it seemed to have like bad internal caching because I think it assumed because it was distributed, it might as well reload off disk because that's what it's for. So if you have like six machines, sure. But if you actually have just like one disk and one memory, you don't, you will lose time to dask. Sorry, random thing. Uh, don't use a fancy object database for relational work. The reason I mainly say that is that a lot of the tools are going to be expecting just row by row data. So if you do this, you're going to end up turning it back into a more simple structure a lot of the time anyway. Um, and once it's in SQLite or whatever database you've chosen, um, you stick indexes in. Because you will probably find a lot of the work will be like the feature engineering. Oh, I want to know more about this. I've figured out something that my model can't see or that I need to add to the data. So you'll go back a lot of the time, and the indexes will make a big difference um, to being able to go back efficiently. Okay, so predicting things. So we've dealt with the boring bit. So um, I haven't gone through like data cleansing and all of that. I feel like there's a lot of advice about that in the world already. Um, so I sort of feel like there's not a lot of point in like reintroducing all of those techniques here. But you, you may want to do that. This in a, a sort of a, step, a repeatable stepwise process. So set up things like a Jupyter. I, I use like Jupyter notebooks, and I call it like one, load the data, two, do the thing, three, do the, like I actually just use the numbers so it turns up in order so that you can repeat these things, things if needed. Okay. So then you're into working with the data. It's the most interesting bit. So the, this, now we start to sort of fork out into more topics than we can reasonably cover in half an hour. Um, but if you go back to those li like lists of data sets, most of those will also come with, like the internet will have tutorials for working with that kind of data. Um, by and large, if th this XG boost thing, if, if your data is like rows of a database, that's, that's just the one to use. Um, there's there's a, a, a number of posts out there called XG boosts, the winningest algorithm on Kaggle, um, and it's, it's up the top for a reason. Uh, it's very robust to a broad variety of different problems and produces really very good results. Um, if you're going to go down the neural network path, unless you are like deep in neural network land, what you need to know is that there are uh, reference architectures for neural network models, and that they have been they've been like thrashed out for image processing effectiveness already. And there's two ways to use them. There's one is is you can just spin them up like Keras will come with. Like you can just load that model. You know you don't even need to specify everything. You just pre process your data to the standard reference input image size at the data processing stage, and you just feed it into the image size the model's expecting. Um, 
and, and away you go. So you can use something called, a, you can take this reference architecture trained from scratch. You can take a pre-trained model is the other, the other way you can sort of leap forward on that one. Um, text, I've said there's this LSTM thing, which is uh, a long short-term memory architecture. There are actually, there's actually a lot more to text machine learning than that. But this is like, if you wanted to produce like, like a simple stupid chatbot that looked like it kind of worked, that's how. If you want to produce like a chatbot that can like respond to queries and actually understand what's going on, then you're into this whole other sort of universe of, of, of trying to work out how to do that. But if you just want to like generate text that looks like, like if you needed to take, you know, 35 Wikipedia pages and produce something that looked boilerplate-y like it vaguely knew what it was doing, that would be the, the mechanism for doing so. And you can also apply it to things like code, which is kind of cool. Okay, so most of the effort, however, should be in the feature engineering. So if you know what's coming, find your standard data set, learn to use whichever one of these techniques you need to use to, produce, to solve a similar problem just for your own benefit, and then spend your time in the hackathon learning about the data at hand and the feature engineering. So the key feature is limited time. A uh, few other uh, hints and tips. Um, make sure you've got a GitHub account set up and that everyone knows how to pull and push from a GitHub account or like whatever. Just make sure you've got easy sharing of, of code set up. Um, you will probably want to share data as well, um, particularly in Australia with our awesome upload speeds. It's actually just, it's usually quicker to do the USB thing. And actually our awesome upload speeds are also a problem with the cloud-based solutions. So you, if you've got like, I don't know, 600 meg of whatever it is to upload to the cloud, that actually takes you a fair whack of time, unfortunately, particularly over an overloaded Wi-Fi connection. Um, bring some USB keys, but you know, practice good USB key hygiene. If you don't know where it's come from, don't plug it in. Um, do use Python and SQL, it's awesome. Um, don't try to do everything in memory with pandas. Uh, it can be done, it turns out it's much slower because um, SQL has amazing indexing. So it's great for taking your tables that you've loaded into a database and joined together and then working with it in memory, fantastic. It's not amazingly good for reprocessing data um, again and again. Uh, do use Jupyter Notebooks, they're amazing. Okay, so this is a, like a little bit of results and application. So this is, this is where we came. There were, we came position number 27 um, there was uh, a, a basic business rule of the, like, so I'm not even going to go into what the domain was, but there was, there was like a one line if statement that would get you 94% accuracy on your prediction and everything else was about how much of that residual between 94% and 100% accuracy you could get. So we got 96%, so, and the best, the, the, the number one which isn't depicted got 97%. So they got about a... 20% bump ahead of us on, on predicting the residuals. Um, but, you know, for a, week, for a weekend of mashing around with it where we had all of those timing problems I just outlined, I felt, we felt like we had achieved a credible outcome. Um, one of the nice things about XGBoost is that it lets you visualise something called feature importance. Um, I tried to understand what that actually meant in a mathematical sense. I couldn't. I just went away with this graph. Um, <laughs> so, broadly speaking, the you know, something, something, ensemble of trees weighting this number. Okay, so the, you can label these. Uh, the, I, I've lost all of my data and notebooks from, from this, so you, you have to look at these F things. But you can label this. So that F8 is probably like that magic rule, effectively like that magic rule I told you about. But all of these other ones are the other features in the data. So if you're doing feature engineering, even if you want to use a more complicated rule or algorithm, you can start with the XGBoost, so long as it's suitable for the problem. Come up with, hey, I think it would be amazing if I like, worked out if it was a full moon and divided it by pi. I think that, that's like the best feature ever. Add it to your list, and then you can visualize what XGBoost thinks the significance of your engineered feature is. And XGBoost is like fast. So you can actually have a pretty like, short loop uh, turnaround time on learning about whether your, your conceptualization of the data and the features is correct. So it's also a, a real accelerator for, for your own experimentation in the process. So that's, if you can do it that way, it's, a, it's really brilliant. So our final solution was uh, 
tolerably uh, skillful. Um, and yeah, the, the main things that, that got us up were um, debugging our code um, so that we were using the XG Boost model appropriately. Um, yeah, we, we like failed pretty hard on the weekend, but it was a one week competition. And we like went out and we're like, we're gonna knock this thing over. We're gonna take as long as it takes. And like an hour in, I'm like, oh, I think this line should like have a different if statement. And then we got 96% and didn't get any further for the rest of the day. But so the biggest win was like, just properly understand the methodology of the tool you use so that you don't make stupid mistakes. The tools work really well. So if you have clean data that you've done your data processing on, a solid reference architecture and the right features, you will get a solid result. It's not like a, a risky thing where you're like gonna be, be lost. You just get those foundations in place and you will be all right. And then you can spend the rest of the time working out how to get that last little bit of the way. Um, okay, so yeah, the difference between number 27 and number one was averaging multiple techniques. Interestingly, in this competition, if you took the number one result predictions and the number two result predictions and averaged them, you got better than the number one result predictions. So ensembling techniques are basically the answer um, to getting those last few percent in terms of whether you should bother doing it or not, but you should do it after your feature engineering, probably. Uh, yeah, uh, just try every strategy. Yeah. People go into, well, why don't we do like a weighted average of all of these ensembles and like is there some value in like doing a more fine-grained sort of approach to the averaging of all of the different input models? And the, the gen general answer on the internet says like, well, theoretically it seems like there should be, but you try that and tell me if it comes out better and it tends not to. So the, the, the weight of opinion seems to be don't bother putting brains into averaging your ensembles, just do a simple average. Done. On time, on time and on budget. Okay, so I'm sorry if I just sort of abruptly ended the, the presentation with, I need, I need a better closing end. <laughs> I, I ran out of cats, so I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I think time for questions. Yeah, awesome. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, I do, no. so, um, so on the averaging, so one of the, techniques is to just take the outputs of those, chuck that into a machine learning algorithm, and then you get this whole pipeline. But I yeah. imagine that sort of is over-engineered for a weekend, or do you just sort of average them and that's the best strategy? I think there's a couple of questions there. One, so basically it appears like, a ba like just a, a simple mean average is actually generally better than feeding it into a more complex model. The only difference would be is if those models were like, quite different and like one of them had a different set of features to the other one, in which case you really might want to, like if this one knows about some things and this one knows about other things, like this one might be some kind of like spatial, have some spatial processing in it and this other one doesn't because it doesn't fit into the tool, then you might go, oh, they've got like different knowledge and then you might want to feed them in because in different circumstances one might, it depends where the conditionals are. So if there's a condition where this one will do better then you probably want, you'll want the pipeline approach. If you think they should perform roughly the same regardless of situation, then you probably want a simple average. Can you uh, share with us some of the tools you use to visualize uh, your data sets that might be geospatial or just to try to plot it, get a better insight when you first got it? Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things. One is it's just like a big, um, uh, you know, feature by feature scatter plot of each one showing the, the, the relationships between each of the features. So like a big big matrix um, of, of the significance of all of the feature inputs. Uh, that's quite useful. Um, just doing a simple, it depends how many features you're working with, I guess. If you've only got like four or five features or something like that, you can just like scatter plot each one, you know, like just get it, just get it visualized however you can. Um, in terms of which visualization tools to use, there's quite a lot of good ones now. Seaborn is good. Uh, Matplotlib, I find, is it's okay, but you have to spend a fair bit of time engineering your plots. You probably, like, just label your axes and just get it on the page rather than worry too much about the details of it because most of this stuff you'll throw away later. Um, showing, getting it on a map can reveal spatial relationships. Like, that's one of the things where all of the tools I just showed you tend to fall down is on complicated spatial relationships. So one of the things you might want to do is get like a, 
uh, geospatial database, or the, I think there's a, a spatial light. I haven't used it personally, but it's geospatial plugging onto SQLite. And then you can calculate things like distances from other things, and then feed that back into the records for use by the, by the other models. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm less strong on the visualization side, so maybe someone else has, has more guidance on the visualization side. I uh, think we have a talk on that coming up later this afternoon, That's so true. that might work. Um, yes. Uh, do we have any, any other questions? Yeah. Applying lots of machine learning or lots of classification methods and optimizing, trying to pick up the worst. Have you ever tried that? I haven't used it uh, in sorry, practice. Could I get you to repeat the question? It's yeah, so the question it. was, hey, teapot, that looks awesome. Um, so what teapot is, is basically it's just a big black box sausage factory that knows about a whole lot of different techniques. And you just feed it the data and just like just in your error function and just tell it to go nuts. And it'll pop out and it says, use this particular model and here's what the score was. So it's, you know, that you might think of it as like a grid search approach where it's not just the meta parameters, it's actually the algorithm and the strategy that's actually being, being searched through, um, which sounds very appealing. When I looked at it, it had a rel like a year ago, it had a relatively limited number of models it actually knew about. Um, and in terms of using it over a weekend, you probably want, if it fits, you probably want to be iterating on your feature, to, your feature engineering more than you want to be searching through model space. So it might be the kind of thing where if you've got a really strong team on this, then yeah, it might actually be really good to go, well, we've got a basic set of features, now let's find out which, you go find the best model, you go engineer features and then throw the features over the fence to the person doing the model engineering. So if you've got a strong enough team, it could be useful, but if it's just like, three of you and you're not, not as deep on some of these things, I would go with the simple approach and feature engineer. Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, do you have any general tips for feature engineering? So for, oh, for general tips for feature engineering, I guess concentrate on things that the models don't know about, so they don't magically know about spatial relation, like large scale spatial relationships very much, so there's nothing in a deep learning model that calculates distances, for example. I mean. If, it's, if you're using like a convolutional approach or an image segmentation approach, it can like find areas of interest and, and so forth. But it doesn't like take that back as an input to distances to other things that it's noticed, et cetera. So things where you can like work out where, the model, where that particular approach is gonna be weak uh, is really good. Like an XG boost would be the same. It would have no clue unless you entered it into like which latitudes and longitudes are close to which other latitudes and longitudes. And Bringing in extra data is always a nice cheaty way of feature engineering. So if you've got like latitudes and longitudes in your data set, you could just find other stuff. Like if people are getting sick, maybe they live in cold climates or maybe they live, you know, so if you can like reason about the world and pull in some more facts, that can be of assistance. All right. Um, so I think uh, that brings us to time. So, um, so could everyone uh, join me in thanking Tennessee? We also have a lovely